So what is biotech? Well, in reality, biotech today is synonymous with genetic engineering, where we modify plants and animals and, and simple cells like bacteria and whatnot. Um, so because of our revolution in DNA with our ability to manipulate it, our ability to splice things out, copy genes, insert them into other organisms, you know, kind of the sky's the limit or whatnot. So we, we think of genetic engineering when we think of biotech. Now, a lot of times people have a lot of questions about this and there's a lot of controversy about genetically modified foods. And I'm gonna show you a video today which illustrates some of the dynamics of that. Um, and appropriately so, we should ask those questions because there are ramifications on when we change the genomes of these various organisms. But I'm gonna explain really what what happens when you create what we call a transgenic organism? Because that's all GMOs are. GMO stands for genetically modified organism. We refer to it as a transgenic organism. That's more, more appropriate to, to what is actually done. Transgenic means that you take genes from another organism and you insert them into a new organism. So let me show you how, how uh, what's done and how we do it and what we can do with it. If you know someone who has type 1 diabetes, then you usually know that they have to go into the pharmacy to be able to get insulin, human insulin. Well, the big question becomes, how do we manufacture human insulin? Do we draw blood from lots of people and then isolate it? So what we had to, used to do in the past with cows, we would take the cow blood, we'd isolate the insulin, and people would inject cow insulin into their blood who had type 1 diabetes. Now we just manufacture the insulin. So how do we do that? Well, transgenics. We take the human insulin gene. There's a gene that makes the human insulin protein. We cut it out. Now, how do we cut it out? We don't have scissors small enough to actually cut the DNA. There are proteins, enzymes, that uh, we actually took from bacteria called restriction enzymes. And these actually recognize certain repetitive sequences of DNA and will cut, will actually uh, uh, cleave the covalent bond that hold those nucleotides together. So each restriction enzyme is actually very specific for a certain DNA sequence. So we can exactly cut out the gene that we want from any organism. So let's say we cut out the human insulin gene, which is what we do. Well, the bacteria, they have one large circular DNA, as I mentioned before. Well, we have to cut their DNA as well in order to splice in the human DNA. Now, this is nothing like those splice movies where you get those alien-human hybrids or anything like that. All we're doing is inserting a human gene into the bacteria's genome. Well, how do we put it back together? Do you remember what type of enzyme we've talked about that can actually seal broken polymers together? Ligase. ligase, exactly. So we just take the ligase and that will glue it back together. It will literally covalently bond these two fragments of DNA. We put it back into the bacteria. Now if you remember what I told you from last lecture, bacteria DNA, our DNA, they treat it the same because we use the same coding sequence, we use the same um, amino acid to codons relationship and so when the bacteria see this gene and be like, okay, I'll make that. And it makes that gene, it's making human insulin. Then all we do is kill the bacteria, extract the protein. We can mass manufacture proteins this way. This is how vaccinations are made. This is how insulin, human growth hormone, you think it, probably we're making it. Um, even industrial chemicals can be made by manufacturing and breaking down certain organics to make ethanol and acetone and things of that sort. So. That's commonly used today. Now, most of the time people are like, eh, I don't have any problem with that. What they do have a problem with is GMOs or the food that is modified. So let me explain how that's done. Because these are also transgenic organisms. And we have to ask the question, what ramifications does it have on our, our health, on the health of an ecosystem? These are good questions to ask. All right, so in the past, farmers used to spray their fields, as they still do today, with, uh, with a bacteria that usually secretes a protein that's toxic to an insect. Well, what scientists have done is instead of spraying the plant with the, with the protein, they cut that protein out of the bacteria by 
pulling out the gene and then splicing it into the plant's genetics. So here we're doing the opposite. Instead of taking human genes and putting them into bacteria, we're taking bacteria genes and we're putting them into a more advanced organism like a, uh, a plant. Once the plant takes that gene up, then its cells actually manufacture that protein. And now instead of having to spray the plants, they have that natural insecticide. It's not natural, so to speak, but it is created by the plant cells. And so in that regard, now the pesticide's in there. Well, some people are like, ah, oh, we got these pesticides in there. What does it do to us? Well, not really anything, but there's still the question of allergens. There's the question of uh, ecological and evolutionary change. And, and these are important questions to ask. Um, I'll show later on when we get into evolution some of those changes that occur. I'm just curious to know what kind of instruments do we have to use to actually grab something so small as an amino acid? Um, technically, we don't just get the one. Technically, we chew it all up, we separate it out, and then we isolate it based upon a, a process, which I'll explain in a second, called gel electrophoresis. Now, we wouldn't be able to do any of these things without an amplification process because we don't just take a cell and then cut the DNA out. We take millions of cells, we cut millions of those DNAs, we isolate that out, and then when we recombine them, it's just the process of so many of them together, some of them are going to recombine and then we do that. So the process itself is actually you know, much more complex than what's being illustrated here, um, but it's very easy. I mean, we could do it even here uh, in the lab. Now. If that weren't enough, we have transgenic animals where you have fish that we've actually put a jellyfish protein into it. Um, these fluorescent jellyfish, uh, it's a, a protein called GFP or green fluorescent protein. There's actually many different types of fluorescent proteins. And most of the time when we do it in animals, it's mainly for research. Um, though this one is actually commercially available and for fun. Um, though most things are done for research. Um, but, but, you know, it, it really brings up those questions of should we be doing this? Uh, now, as far as research goes, there's a lot we can learn by putting these proteins into it. In fact, there are these mice that we genetically engineered to where their bone cells would glow. And so we'd put them under the UV light and their skeletons would glow green. Um, and that was hereditary. We actually are able to make some of these genes get transmitted from one generation to the next, not just you know, in the one organism, but it, it was incorporated into their genome. So that's what a transgenic organism is. It's essentially any organism that has a foreign gene inserted into it. Okay? And then you have to ask the question, well, what purpose is it? Is it for fun? Is it for research? Is it for medicinal use? Um, because there are uh, ramifications of doing so in our crops and in our animals and whatnot. They, they in fact, had genetically modified some uh, fish, gave them some growth hormone, and they became bigger, and they threw them into a lake, and they outcompeted all the other fish and destroyed the ecosystem. So there's mistakes are made. Okay? I'm not saying that we should do this, but I'm also saying that there are reasons to do it as well. There's pros and cons. And that's why it's kind of, uh, not kind of, it's very controversial um, because you know, what are we doing it for and what are, what are the things that it's being used for? Here's another concept that's critical for biotechnology, as I was alluding to. Without this process, nothing would be possible in genetic engineering. It's called the polymerase chain reaction. Now, you've seen the word polymerase before. What is that? You remember? What does DNA polymerase do? basically copies the DNA. Remember, the polymerase will look at the nu nucleotides and actually create a copy of it. So the polymerase chain reaction was something that was invented in, uh, the, in the 70s, about 20 years after Watson and Crick, where they, were, uh, they finally learned how to amplify DNA millions of times over. In fact, this process is so abundantly used today, uh, most you know, biotech students don't know life without it. I, uh, I've been using it for quite a while now too, ever since I was in it, but uh, uh, back in the 70s when they started it, and they kind of perfected it 
you know, another 10 to 15 years later or whatnot to the point where it's just common household everyday, you know, procedures that we do. Well, what the process is, is, and this is what applies to DNA fingerprinting and forensics and paternity tests, and we'll get into that today too, um, is when you have a sample of DNA, in the past, you really weren't able to work much with it because you had a couple of cells, a drop of blood or something like that. You really didn't have much DNA to work with and you couldn't do much with it. But with PCR or polymerase chain reaction, theoretically you could take one cell, usually it takes more than that, but theoretically one cell. Um, and what happens is when you go through this process of PCR, it essentially splits the DNA, copies it, splits it, copies it, splits it, copies it. It's essentially an exponential process where one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight. After about 30 rounds of this, you have over 10 million copies of the DNA. And that takes about, uh, depends upon the machine you have, it takes about an hour, hour and a half to do that, okay? Very rapid, in fact, the FBI use this process so much, they have these machines that go through the, what we call thermocycling so fast, that they can do it in a matter of minutes, you know, like five minutes or so. Um, so PCR is a way of taking a small sample of DNA and amplifying it millions of times over. Now, from a drop of blood, from a crime scene, a swab of cells from a cheek, we can amplify enough DNA to where we can start doing things with it. Uh, before this process, it, it just was too difficult to do uh, what we do today with that. Now, you're not going to have to describe to me how PCR works. In fact, I pretty much left out most of the mechanics of it. But you will need to tell me what it is and what it does. Essentially, it's an amplification process. It's where you take a small sample of DNA and you essentially make millions of copies of it. Now, once that was developed, there were a number of things we could do with that much DNA. The first, one of the first things developed was sequencing. So we're getting into what we now call DNA profiling. Okay, so if you look on my notes and it says DNA profiling, just like when we look at someone and we profile them based upon their features and whatnot, um, DNA profiling is how do we analyze the DNA? When we look at it, what are we analyzing? What are we trying to, to figure out? So the first type of profiling of your DNA is called sequencing. So all sequencing is, is learning the order of the nucleotides, okay? All you're doing when you're sequencing DNA is you're learning what order are the nucleotides in, A, T, C, C, G, 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 T, A, T. Well, what does that teach us? Well, remember we just learned about mutations and how sometimes people have point mutations this will let you know whether you have a point mutation or not. So let's say you think you have Huntington's disease or because your parents had it or whatnot and you want your DNA sequenced and profiled in that regard. Then you would take a, a cheek sample or a blood sample usually, send it to a company. We've got Myriad Genetics up here in Salt Lake that essentially does that type of thing. And they'll sequence your DNA. And what they'll do is they won't look at all of your DNA. They'll look at certain parts, like if you're worried about certain diseases, they'll look at parts of your genes that have those diseases, and they'll look for those mutations. They'll look to see if where you should have a C here, you have a G there. And they're like, oh, yep, that's gonna cause Huntington's disease. And that's what we can do today. So DNA sequencing really just shows you what order your nucleotides are in, and that tells you whether or not you have a type of mutation. All right. Now, we've gotten really good at this. Back in the day, it took over a decade to sequence the whole human genome. Anybody want to venture a guess on how much time it takes now? You know, here 16, 15 years later or so. It takes about two weeks. That's it. Two weeks. 15 years later, and we can do what took us 10 years in the past, now two weeks to do. That's how fast we're advancing in, in this uh, in fact, it's getting cheaper and cheaper to the point where for about $1,000 or $2,000, you can have your genome sequenced. Now, this brings up a number of other issues as well, because let's say you get that profile of your genes, and then somebody says, oh, you're going to have Huntington's disease, and you're a carrier for cystic fibrosis, and da 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 da, da and you don't want your insurance company to see that. Um, I mean, th those are the real questions that we have to ask today. 
do we want our profile out there for the world to see? Um, all right. Now, before we get into DNA fingerprinting, which is another way to profile your DNA, I have to explain this process. You're not going to be tested on this process, but I need to explain it so you understand how it works. It's called gel electrophoresis. Now, if you think of jello, it, you know that jello hardens because we put uh, uh, some gelatin in there and it ultimately coalesces and forms this matrix. Well, in a similar fashion, we use a substance called agarose. Uh, that's an extract from seaweed and whatnot, to create this gel. Now, this gel has these microscopic pores that allows the DNA to go through. When we put DNA on one end of the gel, we pass a current through the gel. The negative end is on this end, the positive end is on this end. Well, DNA is negatively charged, so it's going to run towards the positive end through the gel. But well, here's the thing. The longer strands of DNA are going to weave through the gel much slower than the shorter strands. So this is essentially a way of separating out DNA based upon, excuse me, based upon its size. So if there's you know, a DNA fragment that's 100 nucleotides long, that'll run really fast. If you have another DNA fragment that's 1,000 nucleotides long, that'll run much slower. So depending upon the length of the DNA, you can you know, resolve it out to where you have this pattern, all right? So here's just kind of a sample of an everyday gel that we would run. Those fragments down here are much shorter. They only have maybe 100 or 50 nucleotides to them. And as you go up here, these are ones that run much slower. They're, they're much longer, maybe 1,000, 3,000 nucleotides long, okay? Now, let's talk about what a DNA fingerprint is. Because you hear about this all the time. And most people just think it's used for forensics. But it's not. It's used for paternity tests. It's used for genealogical work or disaster identification. There's many applications to it. So let's look at what a DNA fingerprint actually is and then see why it can actually have these different applications. Not all of your DNA encodes genes. In fact, only a small percentage of your DNA actually encodes genes, 2%. Well, what's in the rest of the 98%? Well, in some areas, these are non-gene encoding regions, so they're areas that don't have any genes to them, we have these repetitive nucleotide sequence called short tandem repeats. Now, what's fascinating is they're in all of us, and they're all in the same places on all of our chromosomes. If you look on one person's chromosome in a particular location at his short tandem repeats, you'll find the same location has, this, uh, has short tandem repeats as well. But here's the thing. Like genes, even though they're not genes, like genes are subject to mutations. So over the years, what's happened is sometimes they've been added or duplicated. Sometimes they've been taken away or whatnot. So when we look at all of our DNA, then we find that most of our short tandem repeats are a little bit different from one another. For example, this man has short tandem repeats that repeat five times. So the repeats go CTA, 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 it does that five times. Over here, this person has seven of those repeats. CTA, 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 it does it seven times. Well, remember what we talked about with gel electrophoresis. If one man has repeats of seven long and another man has repeats of five long, which one's gonna run a little bit faster? The five, because it's shorter. The, the fewer the nucleotides, the faster it's gonna run on the gel, all right? So let's look at a certain situation. Now, you get a drop of blood or a cheek swab from a suspect or you have some semen or something, something with DNA because all of our cells pretty much have DNA. Um, and you run this, uh, uh, you, you grab it and you need to amplify the DNA. So what the scientists do is they use PCR to copy this region over and over and over. That now gives them enough material to work with to run the gel. Normally, a drop of blood wouldn't be enough to do a gel electrophoresis, but because of PCR, now we can. Now, they, they still have to find suspects because the, the DNA itself can't tell you uh, usually you know, who your suspect is. It just gives you the DNA of the person. So in the past, this guy would have been immediately thrown in jail because of his shifty-looking nature, and this guy would have gotten off scot-free. But as it turns out, 
his DNA matches the crime scene evidence. Now let me explain something about our short tandem repeats. We have two of every type. We have two of every type of repeats. Where do we get them from? We get them from both of our parents. So this guy right here, one of his chromosomes he got from his father, the other chromosome he got from his mother. His father gave him 12 repeats and his mother gave him 12 repeats. Over here, this guy, same thing. He got one from his mother, one from his father. In this case, his mother gave him 12 and his father gave him 16 because we inherit our chromosomes from our parents. That's how it works. Um, now, when you run them out on the gel, notice because his repeats are exactly the same, they look like one band because they run at the same speed. But over here, because his repeats are of different lengths, the gel electrophoresis will actually separate the DNA based upon its length. And there, behold, it matches up. Now, if we were to just do this with one set of short tandem repeats, it, it, it really wouldn't tell us much because likelihood, if you're part of the same ethnic group, you typically have a lot in common. However, when you look across five, six, or seven different chromosomes, that's when the fingerprint becomes unique. So look here. On the sides, we have what are called ladders. These are known fragments of DNA, eight repeats long, nine, 10, 11, 12. That's just kind of a measurement system. So over here, we've got 13 individuals that are all being profiled. Notice individuals two, four, and five all have the same pattern. They have repeats of 12 and 13. So you really can't distinguish between those two, uh, all those three individuals just by that one. Well, let's move down to the another. These are chromosomes over here that we're looking at. Now, oh, now their patterns are different. Here, these two guys are the same. This one's different. These are all different. So you can see that once you look across about six different chromosomes, each person's pattern is going to be unique. Okay? So we don't just look at one. We always look at several. And that's how a DNA fingerprint works. You're able to say this blood or this semen or this skin or this spit or whatever the case may be is the same DNA as this person. Now you still have to do other types of things to determine guilty and other stuff like that. But that's what a fingerprint does. That blood is his, not his. And that's really where forensics comes into play. Well, how do we use fingerprint? How do we use this for a, uh, not fingerprint, paternity test? How do we do a paternity test? Well, let me show you. Let's say you have two fathers in question, because it's usually not the mother in question. Um, now, they have a child, and when you look at the child's short tandem repeats, he has his profile. So let's just look at one. Again, we're going to keep it simple. Let's say he has short tandem repeats of three and five. Now, here's how sexual reproduction works. Each parent will pass on half of their genetics, which means that the profile of the child has to have half of its short tandem repeats from the mother and half from the biological father. Okay, so in this version, one of these, we don't know which one necessarily, sometimes we do, but one of these has to come from one parent, one comes from the other. Well, let's, look at, let's do the mother here. Let's say that she has repeats of three and four. Okay? Let's look at this father. Let's say he has repeats of six and seven, and this one has repeats of five and eight. So who do we say is the father? One or two? Why? Because we know the three came from the mother, but he doesn't have a five. He doesn't have a five to give him. He, he couldn't have been the biological father because he couldn't pass it on. Now, sometimes this occurs and you're like, ah, okay, I gotta look at another one. That's why you don't just look at one. You look at six or seven, and there has to be that matching up between the parents. That's where you get that 99% probability of the parents, okay? So, that's really how paternity tests are done. Because we know that a child inherits half of the genetics from each parent, that also means that they have to receive half of the short tandem repeats from one and half of them from the other. Let's look at another child. Let's say that there's two siblings and we still want to figure out who their parents are. Let's say the child has four and eight. Did it come from the same father? Mm -hmm. Why? Why? 
These two are siblings, rightfully so, even though they don't have the exact same short tandem repeats. Why? Because in sexual reproduction, it's a crapshoot which one you pass on. It's a 50 50 chance of which genes, which chromosomes you pass on. You give half of your genetics to your child. So in this scenario, when the sperm and the egg came together, this was the combination of genetics. In this scenario, just as plausible, that's the combination. Do identical twins have the same uh, short time breeding? Yes, they do. Uh, because they're from a single fertilization event and the embryonic mass splits through DNA duplication, they're gonna have the exact same short tandem repeats. Uh, we can still differentiate between twins because uh, uh, mutations do accumulate over time and even their fingerprints the, on their fingers, 90% of your fingerprint is environmentally determined. So even identical twins don't have exactly the same fingerprint. So they're going to be similar, but, but not exactly the same. Uh, but their genetics will be exactly the same initially. Okay, so let's do a couple practice questions with this. Go ahead and pull out your clickers. But that's how a paternity test is essentially done. You take the blood from the mother, blood from uh, the father or, or cheek swab, and you take the DNA sample from the child. You do the profile on all three of them, and the child needs to have matched up one from each parent for them to be the biological uh, offspring of those two parents. Now, the same thing can be done if you want to see if someone's your real, really your sibling. You'll share half of the short tandem repeat statistically with your sibling. So you won't have the exact same, but you will share 50% of those short tandem repeats. So they can look at uh, sibling, uh, um, uh, heritage, I don't know what you call it, um, familial genetics and whatnot. Here we go. Okay, now remember that this is on a simplified level. So if it can be assumed that the parents are the genetic parents, then you assume that. If it's not possible, then, then we assume that they're not the biological parents, okay? So just keep that in mind, because I've had some people be like, well, most of the time, people just remember forensics, because that's what we think of when we think of DNA fingerprint. But now you know that it can also be used for paternity tests. Well, what about some of these others? Let's look at disaster identification. In 9-11, there were a lot of uh, uh, individuals that were just couldn't be found, but they did find body parts, and they wanted to be able to know whether these individuals had died in that tragedy. So what they would do is they would take the tissue samples, they, they ran the profile. Well, they needed something to compare it to. So they typically go back to the person's home, find a, a comb with some hair follicles in it where they had some cells from their hair, and they're able to match them up. And this is how a lot of people were identified where you normally wouldn't be able to know whether or not they had died in some tragedy uh, due to the inability to identify them. But biologically, we're able to identify them because of matching up the DNA, okay? Now, how does historical investigations work? Well, it works like a paternity test, but on a very large scale because uh, humans tend to reside in the same area, the same populations, the same ethnic groups. That's not always the case, but more often than not, you tend to have similar genes, or not genes, similar short tandem repeats to certain populations. So due to the fact that they have taken a number of samples in populations all over the world, that they can look at the similarities and say, oh, you had some heritage back in Africa, you know, so many years back, or back in Europe, you're of European descent. So they can actually look at your genealogical history by comparing your short tandem repeats to the population statistics. And, and we're using that quite often now to kind of look to say, well, where should I be looking for my parentage? Where should I be looking for generations back? Because some people may not even know. Now, here's the thing a DNA fingerprint does not do. It does not tell you anything about your genetics and your, your proteins. It doesn't tell you anything about your genes. I should say genes, not genetics. It doesn't tell you anything about your genes. It doesn't tell you whether you're going to have cystic fibrosis or sickle cell anemia or whether you're predisposed to Huntington's disease or, what, whatever, or cancer or whatever the case may be. So a fingerprint looks at the non-gene encoding parts of your DNA. 
these regions which we call short tandem repeats. They have nothing to do with how your insulin's made or how the, the proteins that regulate the cell cycle and make it so you don't get cancer are regulated. Nothing to do with those. So you, it's only for DNA comparison, sample comparison. Oh, that blood's his. Oh, this child shares half of each of these two parents, paternity tests and so on and so forth. It's about comparisons. But it doesn't tell you anything about the person's uh, profile in terms of what diseases they might have. Now, that's what DNA sequencing can do. If you're questioning whether or not you have inherited a particular mutation from your parents, you can go get your DNA sequence. Not all of it, but certain regions. And this is also comes into cancer research as well. A lot of times uh, there are multiple genes. Now, there's a better way of doing it than just having all your genes sequenced. Sometimes there are known hereditary mutations and there's a quicker way to look at hundreds of genes at the same time. And this is the third way to profile your DNA. It's called a DNA microarray. Now, I'm not going to go through the dynamics of how this is done, but I will tell you what it's for. It essentially profiles hundreds of genes at a time. You don't have to look at one at a time. You could profile hundreds of genes at a time. <coughs> There's two main reasons why we use this today. One, research, where we're looking at any number of questions of uh, proteins and how they behave in the cells. But more importantly, for medicinal reasons, cancer. Because there are so many different genes that can cause cancer. And this is where we're kind of attacking our uh, uh, endeavors to cure cancer today, is first diagnosing what's causing the cancer and then treating it. Okay. So a microarray, it can't tell you who your parents are or whether or not your parents are your biological parents. It doesn't compare two samples of DNA. What it does do is profile hundreds of genes at a time and lets you know whether you have known mutations for, that cause cancer or Huntington's disease or cystic fibrosis. You don't have to look at one at a time. You can look at hundreds at a time. Okay. So. Don't worry about the dynamics of how that's done, but there are these little microchips that have these known mutations on them, and if your DNA hybridizes with it, then you're like, oh, you've got that. So those are the three types of profiles. DNA sequencing, DNA fingerprinting, and a DNA microarray. Now here's the other thing that a microarray can't do. It can't tell you specifically if you've got a, a, an unknown mutation. The only one that can do that is sequencing. Sequencing is the only way to know exactly what type of mutation you have. Is it a frame shift? Is it a point mutation? And whether or not it's going to cause problems. So there's pros and cons to all three of these. Okay. Now, in the last few minutes here, have here, I told you this was a short one, this is the last concept, and then we'll do more review on, on Thursday from this. This is a big controversial topic too, stem cell therapy, or working with stem cells today. So this is also part of biotechnology because it, it comes into play that most of the time when we do cloning of some type, we're usually manipulating the genetics. Sometimes we're manipulating the entire genome and transplanting it from one to another. Other times we're just looking at the stem cells. So here's first a, a quick review or, or recap on what stem cells are. There are two main types of stem cells. There are what we call embryonic stem cells, and these are usually found in the fetus as the embryo is developing. These cells typically have the potential to become any type of cell in the body. So here's what we call a blastocyst. This is before it implants into the uterus. These cells right here are what become you. And all of these cells have the potential to become any cell in your body. You have about 256 different cell types. And these cells can become any one of those. So the potential for these embryonic stem cells is that, let's say someone needs a neuro 
uh, a replacement of neurons because of uh, some neurogenitive disorder, or they need a muscle uh, graft or, or skin graft, or let's say they need to renew their uh, certain elements of their blood. We can take embryonic stem cells and turn them into any one of those cell types. That's the potential of them. Well, there's another type of stem cell called adult stem cells. These don't have as much potential as the embryonic. And you have adult stem cells in every organ of your body. You've got them in your blood. These, this, these stem cells have the potential to regenerate all of your blood, but really nothing else. You've got them in your liver. They regenerate your liver tissues. You've got them in your heart. They regenerate your heart tissues. So the adult stem cells are found in your organs. They pretty much just renew that organ. That's really the limitation is they can renew cells within that organ, like your skin or whatnot. So there's pros and cons to using both of these types of stem cells. Now, for testing purposes, I'm going to look at two different types of cloning. The first type of cloning can use either type of stem cell. We call it therapeutic cloning. Now, what's a perfect example of therapeutic cloning today? Bone marrow transplant. Okay? So a bone marrow transplant, we know that when somebody has maybe cancer like leukemia and they get irradiated and it destroys their immune system, it destroys the cells that make their immune system, then they actually need stem cells from a donor so that they can regenerate their immune system <coughs> and their red blood cells and their platelets. So that's where a bone marrow transplant comes into play. So therapeutic cloning is all about tissue and cell regeneration, where you take cells from someone else and you use it and graft it onto someone. Now, they're getting even better at this to where they can actually take stem cells from your own body and uh, cause them to grow rapidly and then use those to regenerate your own body. So you're using your own adult stem cells, you're just kind of speeding up the process. Uh, in fact, uh, with skin regeneration, they're finding that they can do this on a matter of a couple of days where they take your skin cells, they put them in this media, and after an hour and a half, they put it back on like a burn or some area, and it completely renews the skin. So they're getting really good at advanced stem cell therapy on how to use it to regenerate tissues uh, for therapeutic um, purposes. So therapeutic cloning is the cloning of cells for tissue or, or, or cell regeneration. However, this does not apply to organ regeneration nor to cloning the whole organism. That's where reproductive cloning comes into play. And this is the controversial one. Because it comes, uh, uh, reproductive cloning is essentially what you think of when you think of cloning, where you make an exact copy of the organism. Now, we've gotten so good at this that we can do it with cats and dogs and mice and most animals. And the thing is, plants naturally do this. They naturally clone themselves. If you've ever potato farmed, where you cut pieces of potato off and you throw them in with some fertilizer, they'll grow back into a whole plant by themselves. Carrots, other uh, plants, they'll clone themselves. So we don't have to do anything for them to reproductively clone themselves. It's mainly animals that we have the hardest time with because they pretty much just undergo sexual reproduction, uh, which is not a cloning process. So how do we do it? What is the actual process of cloning? It's obviously much harder than what I'm going to present here, but here's the fundamental basis of it. You get an egg donor, and you take that egg, and you remove the genetic material of that egg. You take the cells from the animal to be cloned. Remember, we kind of started with the sheep, um, but since we've moved on to cats and dogs and other things. You take the nucleus out of those cells and put it into the embryonic uh, egg cell. You let it grow up in a petri dish several times, put it into the surrogate mother and plant it, and essentially grows up, and it is a genetic clone uh, of that. You know, any defects that that organism had, the, the clone will have, okay? So you're literally cloning the same genetics into a new organism, it's like having an identical twin. Now, what are the purposes of this beyond just research? Well, if you've ever seen the movie The Island and other stuff like that, one of the biggest issues that we have is we cannot create organs. Organs can only really be regenerated as the organism grows. Um, now, we're getting better at being able to regenerate uh, organs, but organs are so complex with different types of tissues and cells that it's very difficult to make them. We're, but we're getting better. Like I said, we are being able to use uh, uh, more so today stem cells 
to regenerate kidneys and other types of uh, organs. We're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. Um, most of the time, reproductive cloning in animals is primarily used for research, but some people really love their cat or their dog, and you can clone them. Why you'd want to clone a cat, I don't know. Um, dogs, maybe. Uh, so, 